Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Borelli. I am the chair of the Fire and Emergency Management Committee. I want to thank the speaker for appointing me as chair of the committee, and I'm excited to learn more about the fire department and the New York City emergency management's budgets uh, and how they address the needs of all New Yorkers. First, the committee will review the fire department's proposed budget for FY 2019, its 2018-2022 capital commitment plan, and relevant sections of the preliminary mayor's management report for fiscal 2018. Second, we will hear from New York City Emergency Management. The fire department's physical 2019 pr preliminary budget totals $2 billion with 17,170 positions. Uh, we've got a lot of work ahead, increasing diversity and the veterans headcount at FDNY, assessing the need for additional fire and EMS resources throughout the city, and looking into how best to improve EMS operations through expense and capital budgets. I'm disappointed to see that the budget does not include funding to address the inequity of fire and emergency response resources on Staten Island compared to every other borough, all of which have a squad company. However, I'm looking forward to working with you, Commissioner Nigro, and your staff, and continue the discussion uh, on how uh, the City Council can be a partner with the FDNY to advocate on behalf of these needs. On February 8, 2018, the committee had a hearing on diversity at the FDNY. I want to once again congratulate First Deputy Commissioner Lord Cavanaugh, who's here and on the panel, uh, and Chief of Staff Elizabeth Cascio, who's here too. Uh, while the department continues to make efforts in improving diversity at the FDNY, I'm concerned that there are no real metrics for success. Last month's oversight hearing proved insightful, but the committee would like to learn how the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget supports the department's ongoing efforts. I am also interested in learning how we can work together to improve operations on Staten Island, how firefighters get stationed in different boroughs, and what it costs to operate different companies. Uh, as you know, and probably have tired of hearing from myself and others like Staten Island Borough President Otto, who began asking for a squad company on Staten Island almost two decades ago, Staten Island is the only borough that does not have one. Uh, for 1075 calls on the island, Squad 1 is called from Park Slope in Brooklyn uh, and fights traffic for almost nine miles to the foot of Staten Island uh, going over the Verrazano Bridge. As the city experienced substantial increases in call volume for medical emergencies from one year to the next, the department has added additional tours and increased its EMS classes at the academy, but has not addressed the capital needs to adequately support the growing demand for EMS service. In fact, the FY 2018 to 2022 capital commitment plan only includes a mere 1.5 million for renovations at Fort Totten. Considering the growing demand and need for EMS, the committee is concerned that the current facility and renovation budget is not sufficient. Additionally, I'm interested in learning more about the EMS promotion path and what it costs to train EMTs and paramedics. The committee would like to know what the department plans to do to address these deficiencies, as well as an update on the department's recruitment plan, plans for EMS, and new needs that were added to the FY19 preliminary budget. I also want to thank uh, our, our committee staff for their finance, uh, for their hard work, excuse me, finance analyst Jin Lee, unit head uh, Aisha Wright, committee counsels Brian Crow and Josh Kingsley, policy analyst Will Hognatch, and my chief of staff, uh, Frank Mascia. I want to thank the Commissioner Nigro and, and his staff, uh, all our firefighters, EMTs, and paramedic for the work they do, uh, and I am looking forward to hearing from you, Commissioner. Uh, I'd also like to recognize, before we swear you in, the council members who are joining me today. It's Councilman Diaz, Council Member Gibson, and uh, Council Member, uh, oh my God. Fernando Fernando, Fernando, Fernando we, we, we speak all the time, and I'm, I drew a blank, I'm sorry. That was embarrassing. Uh, so, Commissioner Nigro, I would like the committee council to swear you in. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Please uh, begin whenever you're ready. Well, thank you, and well, good morning, Chair Borelli and all the council members present. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the preliminary budget for fiscal year 2019 for the fire department. I'm joined this morning by First Deputy Commissioner Laura Cavanaugh, Chief of Department James Leonard, Chief of EMS James Booth, and Assistant Commissioner for Budget and Finance Stephen Rush. A year ago, I was able to report that fire deaths for the previous year were at an all-time low. In 2017, however, the city saw an increase to 73 fire deaths. In the month of December alone, 26 people died in fires, the worst month for fire deaths in more than a quarter century. Part of the reason that fire deaths increased last year was that three serious fires took the lives of 22 people. 
We know that every fire death is a tragedy and we mourn for the family and friends of the victims. I want to reassure the council and the people of New York that fire trends over the last decade are encouraging and that fires have been decreasing in general. In 2017, New York experienced an 8% decline in serious fires from 2016 and a 15.5% decline from 2015. That's a difference of 400 fewer serious fires in two years. Though it is painful to suffer 73 deaths, we have come a long way since my first full year in the department, 1970, in which the city experienced 310 fire fatalities. Numbers like that are a thing of the past. Medical incidents were up in every borough in calendar year 2017, and the total number of incidents responded to by the department was over 1.7 million. Despite those increases, citywide response times for ambulances to life-threatening medical emergencies were faster by seven seconds, including 25 seconds faster in the borough of Queens. In other ways, 2017 was a very positive year for the department. I've previously detailed for this committee the tremendous gains that we made in our recent recruitment campaign. 46,000 candidates took the firefighter exam, more than any previous exam. A majority of test takers were people of color, which is also something that has never happened before. More than twice as many women took the exam in 2017 than had taken the previous exam. The number of Asian test takers increased by 55%. Black test takers increased by 39%. Latino test takers increased by 29%. Native American test takers increased by 35%. And the number of female test takers who took the exam improved by 115%. We have strengthened our systematic engagement with candidates who have taken the test in order to turn these positive recruiting numbers into positive appointment numbers. 2017 was also a very strong year for the department's outreach and community engagement. The Fire Safety Education Unit held more than 8,000 fire safety events, providing information and educating 700,000 New Yorkers about fire prevention and life-saving strategies. Many of these were seasonal events in advance of celebrations, including but not limited to Halloween, Christmas, Hanukkah, Lunar New Year, Labor Day, and the 4th of July. Others were provided at block parties, fairs, in school classrooms, and in conjunction with community group events. Some were conducted in response to high-profile fire incidents. The unit disseminates a wide variety of information on various fire safety topics, including kitchen and cooking safety, planning and escape, the importance of maintaining working smoke and carbon monoxide alarms, information focused on children, candle safety, electrical safety, safety tips for seniors, and understanding whether an individual's building is fireproof versus non-fireproof, and how to react accordingly during a fire. Our mobile CPR training unit trained 24,000 New Yorkers to perform bystander CPR including more than 17,000 high school students. In 2017, we collaborated with several of our fellow city agencies to provide fire safety education, including the Department of the Aging, the Department of Education, the Department of Youth and Community Development, the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, and NYCHA. And we will continue working with those agencies this year. We are also especially excited about our upcoming partnership with New York City Emergency Management, which will produce several fire safety mega events in neighborhoods that we are targeting for enhanced fire safety outreach. In addition to aggressively pursuing fire prevention through public outreach, we also continue to improve our risk-based approach to inspections, identifying buildings that are at greatest risk of serious fires so that we can mitigate that risk. I had our analytics team of data scientists undertake a year-long effort to develop an enhanced and dynamic approach to modeling fire risk across the 1.1 million buildings in New York City. 
our new risk model builds significantly on our original risk-based inspection model, which was deployed citywide in 2013, but was largely limited to using data from static variables, such as building type, age, and number of floors. Our enhanced 2018 version of our risk model incorporates dynamic variables from both the department's data as well as from outside sources. We evaluated more than 500 different variables and identified 50 that served as reliable indicators to predict risk of a major fire. We identified variables that provided clues about the structural integrity of a building, the number of reports of gas or water leaks, electrical incidents, or automatic false alarms. We looked at whether a building had a previous fire history. We looked at our EMS data and found a correlation between buildings with a high number of life-threatening medical emergencies and buildings at greater risk of a major fire that could lead to civilian injuries or deaths. And we looked at behavioral factors such as 311 complaints for dirty conditions, noise, or heat problems, which were good proxies for buildings that were at a higher risk of a major fire. We then utilized modern deep learning software, which can recognize patterns in sets of variables and calculate probabilities of outputs. The same software used in predictive applications such as facial recognition. We combined the results into a risk algorithm that narrowed the universe of buildings that will put on the top of our list for fire safety outreach to about 8% of all buildings, a number that we can realistically reach. We are confident that this targeted focus will improve our ability to drive down the risk of a major fire with the continued help of all New Yorkers. We'll begin testing this new approach later this month. As we enter the second term under Mayor de Blasio and under my administration at the fire department, I want to draw the attention of the council to the major investments that we have made in the area of emergency medical services. Since 2014, the department has added 186 ambulance tours, either by adding new ones or taking over tours that were previously operated by private institutions. We've added ambulance units in every borough, including a large number of units in areas that were experienced in longer response times, such as Western Queens and the Bronx. We created tactical response groups, deploying roving additional units in Queens and the Bronx based on hourly response data so that we can attack growing needs with increased resources in real time. We piloted and then received ongoing budget funding for the fly car program in the Bronx, which moves our highly qualified advanced life support resources into non-transport fly cars. The budget funding enables us to continue to operate these ambulances as additional basic life support units staffed by EMTs. This allows us to send both BLS and an ALS resource to individuals experiencing life-threatening emergencies and frees up the ALS resources faster so they can respond to other emergencies. We added 150 additional dispatchers to support emergency medical dispatch, automated the questions that we ask callers reporting medical emergencies with our state-of-the-art computerized triage program and stationed two ambulance units on Rikers Island, dramatically reducing the amount of time it takes to service calls on the island and also reducing response times in Northwest Queens by more than 40 seconds. We also launched a hospital liaison program to reduce, reduce turnaround times at hospitals so that we get our ambulance crews back out more quickly to take the next call. And we've begun rolling out ASAP vehicles, giving us additional flexibility in responding to calls. Through the great support of the de Blasio administration, We've been able to evaluate and improve all facets of how the department conducts emergency medical services, from call processing and dispatching to travel time and ambulance availability. We added EMTs, paramedics, officers, and training and support staff 
and we increase the hardware and apparatus to support all of these programs, including acquiring a large number of new ambulances, tab tablets, and other equipment. We will continue making investments in EMS in fiscal year 19. Including, included in the mayor's preliminary budget are 15 positions for staffing three basic life support ambulance tours that were previously operated by New York Community Hospital. It also continues baseline funding for the fly car program in the Bronx, which was initially funded only as a pilot. The mayor's preliminary budget for fiscal year 19 also includes a variety of critical investments in other areas as well. $1.6 million is allocated for fire prevention programs and $1.3 million is allocated for Bureau of Technology projects. The budget continues to support our diversity goals by providing funding for an additional equal op employment opportunity attorney and an additional staffer to enhance our focus on contracting with minority and women-owned business enterprise eligible firms. One aspect of the mayor's preliminary budget that the council may be particularly interested in is the funding provided for 36 new positions for a joint operations center at PSAC 2, the Public Safety Answering Center in the Bronx, where the NYPD and the FDNY take emergency calls. The joint operations center was conceived on conceived of in order to improve response times and other performance metrics by enhancing communication and increasing supervisory capacity to strengthen the coordination between fire and EMS during emergency responses. We expect the Joint Operations Center to facilitate better load balancing during periods of increased call volume. It will also provide close monitoring that will allow for better identification and mitigation of calls that incur longer response times. The effect will be enhanced real-time monitoring and improved quality assurance of personnel and processing so that we can provide better service to the public and save more lives, which is always our ultimate goal. Later this year, we will be launching the EMT trainee program which will provide an entry-level opportunity for New York City residents interested in pursuing careers in emergency medical service. The department generally hires individuals who have already obtained their EMT certification. But in this program, we will be hiring individuals and conducting all of the training ourselves. EMT trainees will participate in a 16-week program designed to prepare them to pass the New York State EMT exam and become FDNY EMTs. These trainees will be hired from a civil service list, and while the first class will not be chosen until this summer, we know that the list itself is diverse, including 35% African American candidates and 35% women. Finally, in light of recent school shootings, and similar incidents, I want to brief you on the status of our rescue task force. Each rescue task force team is made up of 29 first responders that have received specialized training to triage, treat, and transport victims during an active shooter incident or mass casualty incident. They are also proactively deployed at high profile events such as New Year's in Times Square and Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. The Rescue Task Force's job is to work alongside the NYPD, who provide force protection, to operate in a warm zone to stop the bleeding and to save lives. Each member of the team is outfitted with ballistic protective equipment to protect them during the response. Members have also completed hands-on training to apply tourniquets and combat gauze to stop bleeding. They have participated in full-scale exercises with NYPD's Strategic Response Group to practice responding to an MCI. More than 1,700 FDNY members have undergone the training to become members of the Rescue Task Force. The idea of the, of the task force has been developed in development for a few years, but we accelerated its development after the attacks in Paris in 2015. 
senior members of the department studied incidents as far back as the Columbine High School shooting to learn the best ways for us to be effective in the field. Recent incidents to which the Rescue Task Force has been deployed include the Port Authority bombing, the Chelsea bombing, the active shooter at Bronx Lebanon Hospital Center, and the truck attack that took place in October of last year. The existence of the Rescue Task Force is a good reminder that a modern fire department faces a wide range of challenges from the traditional notion of fighting fires to responding to medical calls and to a large variety of other ways that we are called upon to protect members of the community. With the support of Mayor de Blasio and the partnership of the City Council, we take pride in our mission to serve the people of New York City. I would be happy to take your questions at this time. Thank you, Commissioner, and I'll note we've been joined by Councilmember Maisel, uh, Deutsch, and Brannon. Um, so I guess, uh, and, and again, thank you for your testimony and thank you for your, uh, your staff joining us as well. Um, and before we get specific, uh, just a, a basic question. Uh, was there any new needs that the department requested from OMB but did, uh, did not receive funding in the preliminary budget? Well, I think a uh, fundamental word here is preliminary budget. So I think there are some other things we're still in discussion with, but uh, the administration has been uh, very generous and, and uh, seen the needs of the fire department over the last few years, and I think we have done quite well, and we're confident that we will continue along that path, uh, and the administration recognizes the needs of this department. Um, uniform overtime. The, uh, the total budget for city-funded uh, city uniform overtime was $228 million, uh, and for FY19 is $206 million. Is the overtime control working in, in, that, that's in place now? Well, I think uh, I'll let Commissioner Rush, uh, who has a pretty good handle on the numbers here, discuss some of that. <clears throat> it's working to an extent because we are hiring firefighters and that is the main driver of overtime cost when you have vacancies in the fire side. So as those vacancies are filled, we have a class of 320 in the, 300 in the academy right now. When they graduate, they will continue to help reduce overtime. We're also hit by challenges like in the fall, we had three hurricanes that we were deployed to. That drove costs to $5 million in overtime. We will be reimbursed for those costs, but um, those drivers do impact the overtime. So while the overtime is challenging, um, the year's not over yet. Um, we expect to at least come close to target. Yeah, so, so you're, you're saying that for, for FY 2018, um, you project being close to the target, and, and what is that target? The target is, as you said, $228 million. That's city funds. Okay. Um, when was the last time the department reviewed firefighter staffing levels? You know, we, we seem to have been at the same level for, for a number of uh, years. Um, is there an estimate on when you foresee the head count needing to change, either more or less? Well, our numbers are really, uh, we have a static number of units. We have a each unit is staffed in a, in, a, in a manner, whether it's four firefighters or five firefighters that is contractually agreed upon. So the department really is based on that number. Now, if, if future needs call for additional units, um, of course, the staffing numbers, the, the gross number of firefighters, fire officers would have to be increased. But, but not every company is staffed at the same level. Um, what are some of the decisions why there might be a few extra firefighters, other than obviously companies that have a fifth man engine versus non, but other than that, why would well, they be? Well, special operations units such as rescues or squads or hazmat units have additional staffing. Ladder companies are staffed with an officer and five firefighters. The ma vast majority of engine companies are staffed with an officer and four firefighters. Uh, there is a, a contract between the UFA and the city that calls for five firefighters in a set number of units. That number um, increases by five each year um, for one more year, I believe. Um, how do you determine the needs of where specialized units go? 
where they're quartered, where they're assigned? Well, the department has uh, five rescue companies, one in each borough. The department has uh, squad companies in every borough, as you said before, but Staten Island. Uh, they were, those companies were originally placed based on the n fire responses so that the areas um, were all, with more fires had additional squad companies. And um, Staten Island was not part of that equation. I'm assuming it's because the, the overall number of fires was less. Correct. The overall number of fires citywide has dropped, but we haven't eliminated squad companies. We have not. That's a good thing. That's, that's, that's a positive. Good, that's a positive. Uh, w so what kind of calls outside of the, the squad's first due area would a squad company respond to? Well, they respond to, they respond first and foremost um, to serious fires. Uh, all hands are great as multiple alarms, additional squads are called. They respond to alarms that require the additional skills of our special operations forces. So uh, rescue and squads have higher levels of training than the other members of the department, and they would be special called to certain incidents that require uh, that level of expertise and equipment. Yesterday during the storm, um, was there a squad located on Staten Island or a squad company formed? Uh, a, a Jim, Jim could answer that. I, I believe we certainly added resources to Staten Island, but um, I'll let Jim answer. We did not add a squad there yesterday. We felt that the, we added uh, uh, 14 or, uh, rapid response vehicles based on the type of storm that we had. So de determining when we need an additional squad out there or not is sometimes weather driven, if we can get over there and what the, we're anticipating the issue might be. The other night for the wind driven storm, uh, we had an additional squad out there. For yesterday's storm, we added the additional uh, 14 RRVs, which are uh, an officer and three firefighters that can handle trees down, uh, e electrical emergencies, uh, those type of emergencies. So we look at the, the situation that we're facing on, uh, on an individual case and decide whether we want it. Is, is the reason for assigning the company there a couple of times a year, I assume, um, is that done because of the response time or because they, you might feel they would be prevented from getting to the island should they be needed? Both. Both. Um, so all hands fires, how many of them were on Staten Island in uh, last year? I'll, I can get you that information, certainly. I don't have it at the... But, the, I mean, there, every all-hands fire on Staten Island triggers an automatic response where a squad company is assigned. Correct. And that happens in every borough. It happens in every borough. So we, we sent a letter over, and, 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 you know, certainly, I don't expect maybe you don't have the answer now, but how many times was an all-hands fire declared on Staten Island and squad one who would have been assigned there and would have responded anywhere else. Since you can't give me the exact number, what's the percentage in your estimate of times they actually provided a service to a fire that they were assigned to show up at? Well, all of the times that the squad, squad one is called to Staten Island, and not all for all hands fires. So if they were called there, uh, Less than half of the time that they are called to Staten Island, they actually arrive on Staten Island. What percentage of those calls to the island were actually for all hands fires, um, don't have. But I know that less than half of the times they are dispatched to respond to Staten Island, they do not get to the uh, operation. And is that because that the, the fire is under control? I mean, so in other words, the call goes out there's an automatic response from the unit, they mobilize and they move out, and then at some later point, some decision maker flags them off. Well, I have the number now for you. There were 125 serious fires on Staten Island, 114 all hands, and uh, 11 multiple alarms. That's in one year? In, the, in last year, calendar year 2017. Many of the times the fire is, is placed under control probably will hold a squad as needed and they're turned around before they get to the fire. That's correct. 
Is, is there a way to determine how much time uh, Squad 1 spends out of quarters responding to Staten Island and then not making it to the fire? I suppose there may be. I don't think we keep track of that number, but uh, we could find out. But they, but they still have responsibilities in their first due area. They certainly do. So would placing an additional squad on Staten Island enhance response times and capabilities in Brooklyn? I'm sure it would to a certain extent. The, the calls where uh, Squad 1 is responding to Staten Island, they are therefore unavailable for calls uh, in their response area in Brooklyn. So um, that would be a result of that, correct? Um, is there anywhere else in the city where a squad company is as inaccessible and routinely doesn't show up for the fires that they would regularly be assigned? I would have to say Staten Island would be the, f certainly the, and especially the uh, western portions would be the furthest trip any of our squad companies would respond on a, no on a normal basis, that's correct. Is the department familiar with some of the new development plans of factories, warehousing, um, power plants, et cetera, on the West Shore of Staten Island? Absolutely, and that's why we, you know, are looking at the needs of a squad on Staten Island and are certainly uh, um, in conversation about that and, and studying that. And then my final question, and I'll move on to something else. Um, Re Rescue 5 is uh, our only specialized unit. How often are they responding to battalions in Brooklyn? I mean, I, I understand Brooklyn is far busier than Staten Island, and some of the battalions in Staten Island aren't as... I think um, Rescue 5 gets about 250 calls a year to leave Staten Island to respond to a certain portion of Brooklyn. So that's, the, you know, the same thing holds true. They're spending an amount of time in traffic on the bridge, not in quarters. Some amount, yeah, they are spending some amount of time responding from their quarters, which is very close to the bridge, but nonetheless um, attempting to get to alarms in uh, portions of Brooklyn. But, but since they're in with an engine company, they don't have their own first due area. Well, they have an area in Staten Island that they're responsible for, certainly. Okay. Um, is there, do, do we have any empty bays uh, in firehouses where uh, an a new apparatus could be placed? Jim, <laughs> I, I'm, I don't know. Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, would they need any significant modification to house uh, another squad engine? I'd have to look at that, but uh, I'd, I'd have to look at that. Um, all right, I'll move on. So I think you guys did a great job with, with taking over the, the New York Community Hospital tours. Um, do, do you, are you familiar with any other private ambulance uh, companies or hospitals that may be facing the same challenges where hospital ambulances may go offline in the next year? Uh, specifically, no, but um, certainly we've had that suddenly happened to us in the past or in the Bronx and um, we are aware of it the department is there a way is, to itemize what the cost is though for those specific for that specific change we can item, we know the cost of adding a tour um, to, to cover but uh, but outside of adding the tour there was no capital needs no, nothing like that do we have to add new ambulances eventually there is you know there's um, the more ambulances we add, the more places we need to put them. Right now, we don't anticipate in the near future any closings, not that I'm aware of. So in, in my previous life uh, in the state legislature, I was on the health committee and remember that when a hospital's closing, there's uh, a whole series of public hearings and, and uh, notifications, and it's a, it's a lengthy process. Is there any process uh, similar for the closing of ambulance services through a hospital? Jim? Good morning. Um, Good morning. When we get notified that an, a, a uh, private hospital is uh, going to reduce uh, services for whatever reason, they give us a 90-day notice and uh, we do an assessment of the area and we see what we have already in the area um, and then we try to backfill the uh, units that the voluntary hospital or private hospital is, is now taking out of the system, which we have done successfully in the past. 
what are some of the reasons they would would uh, end service? It's just not profitable. They're not recovering enough money from the insurance companies, Medicaid, et cetera. All of the above. Sir. All of the above. Okay. Um, what is the cost to train? You, you mentioned the EMT training program. What, what is the overall cost to train new EMTs and paramedics? You know, both PS and OTPS. I'll give that to you, Steve. <clears throat> the department allocates approximately seventeen million dollars in our in our budget to the EMS Academy. Um, so we have a per student cost of about four thousand dollars for an EMT. For a paramedic, since the cost is um, an EMT has to be trained for nine months to be a paramedic. It's much more expensive. It's probably five times that. Uh, is, the, is the revolving door, the fact that a lot of EMTs uh, move on after two, three years, is that a, is that a problem? If, if the length of service or, or the incentive to stay on the EMS job was greater, would that reduce the cost of training? Well, I, I think it's both a problem and a benefit in that uh, firefighters do respond to approximately 800 medical calls a day, um, bringing people who are already trained as EMTs over to firefighters uh, benefits the department, benefits the people of the city. And of course, there is the, the problem of needing to train more EMTs to fill in for the ones that become firefighters. So it's a uh, sort of a balance that we do. But the EMT training in the EMT Academy doesn't take the place of uh, training in the fire academy. Like there's no, there's no cost savings or anything. For the training, negative. No, there is none. Um, as far as paramedics, is there any plan to uh, reinstate a, a grant program for the training of paramedics? I, I'd have to say no. We haven't. Which grant program? We're not a, I don't think we've been asked. Uh, I'm not aware of any. Okay. Um, is there a plan to increase EMS officer levels? I think we have been increasing EMS officer levels. And um, we continue to go forward with that. There is no plan to, uh, other than our increase in fly cars, et cetera, to increase the number of officers in EMS. Okay, so there's no, no plan to increase the ratio then, essentially, between office, EMS officers and EMS. No, we are we are negotiate, you know, in discussion with the union and OLR about that issue, about the span of control issue that uh, I, I know this uh, of concern um, to the union, and we are in discussion with them, but uh, that's about it. And with the uh, rescue task force, um, are EMS officers? provided with ballistic vests as well? Every member of the task force is provided with ballistic vests and helmets. So is there any effort to upgrade some of the EMS ballistic vests that might, might be old? That's a separate, um, the ballistic vests that are provided to the task force are military grade ballistic vests and helmets, uh, which is a separate vest from that which was at one time provided to all members of EMS. And that's no longer the case? That is no longer the case. And we do not have, right now, we do not have a plan to replace those vests. Is there is there a cost uh, estimate out there for that plan? Yeah, there is. Um, the initial cost would be $1.5 million. And then if you had some a replacement cycle, it would be in the name range of like half a million dollars per year that would have to be allocated. Okay. Um, I'm going to open it up to some council members if uh, you guys are ready. You have the list? So first I'll call on council member Cabrera for our first round of questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, Commissioner. Welcome. And to all your staff, thank you for all the hard work and devotion uh, to the city. Uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, one was regarding uh, if you could share with us uh, the the carrying plans for firehouse renovations in the Bronx. Are there any particular ones that are gonna be renovated? Uh, I don't have the list of them, Steve, do we know? Well, there certainly is, is plans for renovation of firehouses throughout the city. It's a, uh, 
a long process. Some of them are extensive renovations that take uh, sometimes more than a year. Some of them are minor renovations, but I'm sure some of them in the Bronx are slated for uh, renovation. Uh, can you please send us a list? I can provide you a list. There's a significant amount of capital funds across the facility's budget, and they prioritize them based on the state of the conditions of the firehouses. Does, does that include special equipment as well? I remember about three years ago, one of our firehouses uh, requested special uh, equipment for training, like the door there, one. Yeah, the, um, yes, the, there is funding provided actually by the council um, at the end of the year and through the Fire Foundation provides money for these uh, special equipment that you're talking and discussing. Uh, the other thing is, Commissioner, you mentioned that it was a good thing for EMTs, for the fire department to, to have, to be able to hire uh, EMTs and I, I could see um, the logic if you're on the other side, but if you're on the EMT side, do, do you think that affects morale, uh, historical knowledge, um, the whole idea of being able to have people who have been there for a long time and provide uh, that legacy knowledge and, and the context also uh, even more important, I would think, is the, the sense of being value for the work that they do. Uh, do you think that has an effect on them? Well, again, I think, I think that's a, a mixed bag, so to speak, that it would increase the morale for some people, giving them an additional uh, avenue for employment um, in which the salary range is higher. And amongst others, it might not, but uh, um, certainly it is for those who wish to move to become firefighters, it is a great opportunity. For those who think it um, takes away the experienced members of EMS, uh, they would feel it reduces morale. So um, I guess it's a double-edged sword. Fundamentally, why is there a disparity in pay? Since well, <laughs> they're different job titles, they have different negotiations, um, different unions represent the members, and it has historically been a difference of salary for which the department is not um, in charge of changing. But the way it exists now, uh, paramedics make more than EMTs, firefighters earn more than, e than EMTs, and that's the system. I'm hopeful in the next negotiation uh, we could uh, affirm uh, their value uh, through pay, and um, I'm hopeful uh, that we could do that. Thank you, Commissioner. Very good. I run out of time. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Council Mr. Member Chair. Brennan. Thank you, Chair Burley. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks for all you do. Um, I wanted to just bring up the uh, issue with the fifth man. If there was uh, any discussion about bringing that back for good. Didn't see it listed here, but hopefully it's part of the conversation. If not, why not? How can we make it part of the conversation? Well, the latest uh, iteration of the contract between the UFA and, and the city calls for an additional five firefighter engine each year. Um, February 1st was to have been 15, next year would be 20, and I, then they renegotiate uh, once again with the city. But right now, that's the plan going forward that, um, now the other piece of that, of the contract, says that if medical leave exceeds 7.5%, the department must reduce the staffing down to four in those five firefighter units and that's the agreement that the UFA made with OLR at the time of the contract signing. Hearing from a lot of guys on the job in my district who talk about the need, especially in cold weather, the need for a fifth man, whether it's frozen hydrants or that kind of thing. So if there's anything, any way we could be helpful there. Well, I, I think no one disputes the fact that, um, you know, additional firefighters, um, 
is an advantage, but the department has been operating quite successfully for many years with four firefighter engines, and we, uh, we have not had issues with that staffing level. Okay. A, a quick follow-up. How does the department determine which firehouses uh, have five men and which have four people? I shouldn't say men, right? Well, I think um, the experts amongst our chiefs and uh, our statistical folks would look at what companies, I, I think, um, the level of fire activity and the amount of times an engine would arrive um, ahead of others and be forced to operate alone comes into play in that equation. And um, they've been very good at assessing the, the needs and each year selecting the five units uh, that would get an enhanced staffing level. Uh, Council Member Deutsch. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, for this important hearing. Um, so uh, first of all, I just want to commend you, um, Commissioner, for coming into my district and speaking to over 40 educators to pass on the fire education to the students of their respective schools. And uh, I made sure to make it non-political, so no elected officials were invited, and I as well did not attend. So we, uh, it was a, uh, I heard it was a very productive meeting. And I also want to commend uh, Laura for always being available. And over the last um, a few months, I had over uh, about eight fire safety events in, in my district, throughout my district. And your staff has been uh, uh, very responsive, and they were really amazing, and the people really benefited from the whole thing. In addition to that, um, I sent a letter to the administration, to the mayor's office, as well as the speaker of the city council, uh, to, um, to renew the Get Alarmed NYC initiative. Uh, we had uh, 45 members signed on to my, to my letter to, to the administration and as well as I asked uh, the mayor's office to reach out to the manufacturer, Kidder, to see if we could get the additional $3 million which we received uh, back in 2015. Um, so um, now, my question is now, what is, what is your total headcount within the fire department uh, with, that includes the FDNY, EMS, and, and all the personnel? I think we're slightly over 17,000 right now, about 17,100 and change. Now, how many, uh, how many of the 17,000 are uh, either veterans or, 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 active members of, um, or active members of the military? Um, I don't know if anyone here at the table has that number, but we can certainly get that, uh, the department takes great pride in trying to recruit and successfully recruiting veterans and each and every one of our probationary firefighter classes includes a large number of veterans. Uh, how, do you, how do you conduct your outreach uh, to veterans? Well, we, for the first time uh, in the department's history, we have a veterans outreach coordinator um, in which uh, specifically targets uh, active duty military, and um, from all around our area and interests them who become uh, just natural subjects for us, people who are, are used to uh, being in that type of profession. And they have been successful in, uh, in recruiting more and more veterans to the department. We've always uh, been known for having a large number of veterans and we expect to always be in that. Great. I appreciate that. As the chair of the Veterans Committee, I'm looking forward to continuing working with you um, to, to ensure that our veterans um, have a place in the fire department. Uh, I think we have uh, just got some numbers here. Uh, almost 11 percent of our uh, uniform people are veterans. In total of our total workforce, it's 8.2 percent uh, veterans right now, which is uh, considering only fewer than 1% of the population of our country serve uh, in the military, uh, it's, a, it's a very reasonable number. All right, we have about 220,000 approximately. Thank you very much, Commissioner, and, uh, uh, and looking forward to continue working with your office and doing great things in the future and reducing uh, fires and tragedies uh, throughout the city. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
And I'll note we've been joined by Council Member uh, Amphrey Samuel. And does she have any questions? No? Okay. Anybody have a second round of questions? Um, oh, Cab Cabrera. No, please, I, I implore you. He's so courteous, and thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, so, um, I did have one question in the fiscal 2018 budget added 30 million to improve EMS operations in the Bronx. Uh, can you provide uh, the committee on, this, on the progress of this? Well, progress in so much as uh, the added tours in the Bronx, we were, we were experiencing a, a, a real spike in response times in the Bronx, and we felt that the, uh, the population of that borough was certainly suffering from that response times going up, up, up. And we asked for increased funding. We added um, teams to go up there. We, we put the fly car project in. We added tours to the Bronx, and we were able to bring the Bronx back down to not only um, from the longest response times, but to be one of the uh, fastest response times in the city so that the people of that borough were no longer being uh, neglected, so to speak. Uh, it's a borough that has a great need for our services, and uh, we intend to service it uh, as the needs exist. And my last question, which I ask every year, uh, within actually the last four years, I have asked this question of this committee, uh, is uh, any new te technology that you see in the horizon, uh, that you see in other municipalities or internationally, and uh, how prepared are we for citywide catastrophes such as an earthquake or any, uh, any of uh, the sort? Well, I, I think the department has made great strides since September 11, 2001 in preparing for any and all types. Um, certainly we proved it during Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy. Um, the department stands ready to serve the people of the city um, regardless of the level uh, of disaster that strikes the city. I think as far as technology, we have put an inordinate amount of money and hired an inordinate amount of people in the last few years in that area to bring us up. It was an area we were lagging in, uh, self-admittedly, and I believe that to be no longer the case. And um, we have a, a staff that's second to none in that field and are moving ahead in, with many technology projects that will bring us into the 21st century very pridefully. Uh, I think Laura could be a little more specific on that if you choose to be, but uh, um, Laura's been spearheading that for the department for the last few years. Uh, sure, just to expand on that, I think a couple of the places we're really looking, one is a conduit project involving getting fiber to every firehouse and EMS station, and that will give us a much greater capacity at those stations to utilize some new te technology that's out there. Um, so that's one place. The other is in mobile applications, and that's really what the commissioner is referring to. We've staffed up internally so that we have the capacity to build applications that the firefighters and EMTs need in the field. Um, and we're currently beta testing a few. Uh, they mostly give either situ situational awareness to the firefighters, or in the case of EMTs, uh, additional tools to interact with their patients. And we'd actually be happy to demo those for you if you're interested. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to one of these days that we have the technology that we'll be able to somehow from a helicopter or another airspace uh, uh, vehicle to be able to shoot some kind of a projectile to, you know, to subdue the fire somehow, you know. I know the, the science fiction of yesterday's reality of today, so uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Staying on technology for a second, right now are all FDNY ambulances equipped with uh, GPS? Jim? All? Uh, I think they every are. Every FDNY ambulance is dispatched using automatic vehicle locator system. Um, and that is uh, the ambulance is determined to be the closest to the assignment. 
and they get sent. That's how we make the recommendation via the computer. Is there a directional app or, or a, a monitor that someone yep. responding has directions to the location? Yep. Yes, there is a mobile mapping project that Commissioner Cavanaugh can speak to with greater authority. Um, yeah, I, I'd have to double check. We had a few ambulances left. Um, they were in under repairs, so they hadn't been uh, updated yet, but the vast majority of our ambulances do have that. Um, like I mentioned, we are piloting mobile applications, and we hope that that would be an additional um, way to help the EMTs get around. Uh, the GPS we're referring to is actually in the ambulance on the MDT. Okay. Um, so just to go back to the fly cars for a second, they, they seem to be supported uh, by the department, and they seem to be successful. Is there any plan to expand the program to other boroughs? Is there a cost estimate? Is that something that this council should be, you know, fighting for? Well, I think what the, the department uh, would like to roll this out the way we rolled out CPR years ago, which is borough by borough. So the plan is to um, continue expanding in the Bronx. We're in discussions now uh, to do that, to expand it further in the Bronx, and to uh, continue to assess the value of it. And that's the, the plan for the department. We do believe it has great value, and it has already shown that um, in the percentage of calls that are answered by uh, advanced life support and, uh, and the enhanced response times. Right. So you, you mentioned that, and I think that's a great thing to highlight that response times have dropped. Um, is there anything else that the department is doing to, to further decrease response times? Is there anything you could be doing, frankly? Well, I think part of it we um, uh, comes at the dispatch end. I think our uh, triage triaging is better today. I believe um, we've added additional tours that that uh, decrease response time, um, and those types of things will enha enhance it. So our response times right now are uh, better than they've ever been, thanks to these improvements. And can you touch upon the recruitment budget for next year? Um, I noted that it, it included uh, 181000 for an agency attorney. What, what is specifically the, the function of that attorney, and how do they support the recruitment efforts? Uh, I believe the agency attorney is for EEO, not for recruitment. Okay. Um, stay on diversity then. C can you talk about the, the overall budget for diversity recruitment? next year? Sure. So I think the important thing to note is that the budget for recruitment is very cyclical. We spend the most money in the test years or the year before the test is given, and I think uh, that's the $11 million budget you've heard us refer to in this past year, in 2017. Um, we expect it will be probably at similar levels four years from now. Um, in between, the budget mostly consists of PS costs of staff, um, and there's a staff of about 15 to 20 permanent employees at FDNY that does recruitment and diversity and community affairs work. I, I remember uh, at the last hearing there was a discussion how uh, there was a number of people of color who had taken the exam, passed the exam, and then through self-attrition had, had uh, removed themselves from the hiring process. Uh, do, do you think that going to an annual testing or a rolling testing uh, would lessen the likelihood of those people doing that? From what we've looked at so far, it would not. It would not make it worse. Um, it'd be about what it is right now. So it sort of wouldn't make a difference to recruitment. W would there be an additional cost? In other words, you said this was cyclical. So if we went to a, an annual test, would the cyclical uh, cost change or would it be the same every year? Um, I, I would even out. Um, we probably wouldn't spend quite as much because we'd be recruiting on a more consistent basis rather than having to recruit very intensely every four years. Um, but I, there may be additional costs to DCAS, who actually administers the test, that I wouldn't be uh, privy to. But in terms of the FDNY recruitment budget, it would probably be similar, but it would even out year to year. Yeah, I, I believe DCAS in the past has said they they would have additional, but you'd have sure. to uh, ask them what I'm, that additional cost would be. Yeah, we're not concerned about that. Um, but you said that, that you don't think it would would decrease um, self-attrition. Wouldn't there, I mean, just, just on the face of that, wouldn't there be a less likelihood that someone removes themselves from the hiring process if the hiring process took a year rather than four years, five years? So it wouldn't actually change the length of the entire hiring process. It would only change the length of time between when we recruit you and when you take the test. But the real wait time is actually after that. Because the fire department, you know, 
luckily has employees who do like to stay with the department. We have a very low attrition rate. And so the rate of hiring is really what affects how quickly we can bring people but off But if you're list. hiring from one list for, for almost four years, um, if there's an annual test, wouldn't, wouldn't you be just hiring from one list for one year? You would, but you'd can be consistently taking just, you know, I think about 3% of people come off the list right now. That would drop even further. You'd just be taking a few people before you had to start that again. And so for most people, they'd be taking multiple tests until they had the opportunity to get on the job. Um, most of the people at the very top of the list would probably have a significant number of additional points like veterans and residency credits, um, even to be able to come off the list. So again, for the vast majority of candidates, the weight would be the same regardless of how often the test was given. Okay, and then uh, you, you spoke uh, to Haim Doy's question about military recruitment, but can you go over just how the rest of the recruitment budget is, is broken down? What is, what, is, what is the city getting for their money in that sense? So the majority of costs are either, in terms of the OTPS budget, the majority of the costs are advertising, um, which is, in the case of the last campaign, advertising of all kinds, online, TV, radio, um, any basically any advertising you can do in the city of New York, you, we did. Um, one of the things that we will be looking at is we are able to track this go-round in a way that we couldn't in the past where successful candidates came from in terms of the advertising streams. And so we will be making an adjustment um, after we get the scores of the candidates in the spring and we see who actually made it through the process and took the test. We will make adjustments to that advertising budget in the future based on which streams were most successful. Uh, and then the rest of the costs are uh, overtime and the full-time staff and recruitment. Okay, and then just the, the final topic um, before I think we're finished is uh, just looking at the mayor's management report. Um, so it indicates the total number of company runs has decreased by 3% uh, compared to FY17. Is there something you could attribute as to why the number has decreased? What number are we discussing now? In FY17, the four-month uh, year-to-date was 300,900. 396,000, excuse me, uh, runs. Now there are 386,000 runs, same time year to date. Like, is there is there something we, we, we can draw from that? Is there is that normal? Is that cyclical? I think it's too small and short a period to make any uh, discuss that yet. You know, to exactly what we can attribute that to. We can look into it, but I think it's a bit of a snapshot right now. I only ask that because the, the numbers from uh, between FY15, 16, and 17 are kind of even, um, and I thought maybe there, there happened to be uh, some reason. Um, the, the other question from the management report is about the number of inspections. Is there a schedule of when inspections were done and how certain um, buildings, businesses, et cetera, get inspected? Well, there is, and, uh, you know, I discussed it in... Uh there's two different types of inspections, of course. There's, we have a uh, fire prevention inspectors that are not firefighters that go out and do inspections, most of which are um, commercial, required by different codes, and, and et cetera. And then there are, are companies, every fire company that goes out and inspects buildings in their district. Those buildings that they inspect are selected based on our, our algorithm that predicts which buildings have the greatest possibility of potential uh, for fire. And that's about 11 percent of, uh, of the buildings that we're able to, of the 1.1 million buildings in the city that we're able to get to. So we try to predict where we get the biggest bang for our buck, so to speak, and that's how we do it through this very advanced um, system uh, predictive. So if there were, in other words, two restaurants um on the same block that uh, one was built in a, a new non-combustible building, one was built in an old building, right. there's a more likelihood that the restaurant in the older building would get inspected more often? Well, fire prevention inspectors would inspect all of them, right. you know, the range hoods, et cetera, the, the parts that they are responsible for extinguishing systems. And the building itself, based on that algorithm, if, if it's uh, in a new fireproof building, would be less likely for that building to be selected than if it was in an old law tenement uh, in an area of the city that uh, experiences higher fire activity. 
And I, I think my final question, unless anyone else has one, anybody with um, according to the report, the number of fire investigations has increased over the years, but the number of uh, structural and non-structural fires has decreased. Is there a, a reason for that? Is that a, something that you, you've enhanced? Well, other than I would say the uh, increased productivity of our Bureau of Fire Prevention, uh, of, of uh, fire investigation, um, they, do ins they do these investigations for two reasons. First of all, to see if there was arson involved and to uh, uh, prosecute and which they do a very good job on, and also to tell us what the cause of fires are so we can pinpoint for fire education uh, what's increasing, what's decreasing, what areas um, we should concentrate on. So they are a great resource to our fire safety education plans in that they will tell us uh, fires from careless smoking are increasing, fires from uh, use of candles are increasing, and this is where we should place our focus with our materials and our and our visits. So, um, is, they do is quite there a, a need to, to hire more investigators? Or would, I think would, we have uh, over the past few years hired more, and uh, we do see a benefit to that. But um, I don't think in the immediate future we intend to increase it by too much. Well, Commissioner, I lied to you. Uh, Councilmember Cabrera has one more question. Uh, Commissioner, I'm just curious to know, how many chaplains do you have, paid chaplains? Eight? I think we have seven or eight, yeah. Seven or eight. Is that sufficient for so many uh, firefighters? Well, it's probably the highest number we've, uh, we've ever had in the department, but it has been sufficient, we think. But we're always, we're always evaluating what we have, and um, might that change? Um, I would encourage to uh, hire a few more. I know the NYPDs, their numbers went up. And also, they, I noticed uh, with the NYPD, they have a new program to have in each precinct a volunteer chaplain. That might be something to look into, and maybe the eight chaplains that you have right now will help coordinate that. There's no cost other than uh, time, but they'll be able to multiply themselves, provide some training, something to look at. Yes, sure. Because they, you know, they're dealing with critical incidents, and uh, from what I know from critical incidents, debriefing uh, after you know, such an event is, is critical. Now we also have a counseling service unit and uh, with professional and peer counselors, that's um, fairly substantial. But uh, it is, as you say, a need in, the de in departments that deal with uh, the types of incidents that we do, it's always a need. And I'm very happy to hear that you have the counseling piece as well. I think that's critical. Uh, one added value that studies have shown is that there is a tendency uh, for people to trust uh, chaplains uh, and people of faith a bit more than counselors. I wear both hats, so I know about that. Uh, so uh, it gets more a great, it will increase the chances, I think, of uh, the firefighters to be able to uh, find somebody to talk to. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll also note that the council member is a pastor and term limited and looks nice in a uniform in <laughs> case you're <laughs> plugging yourself. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, just I'm sorry, one more question from uh, Council Member Deutsch. Thank you. Um, so, I just, I brought up at a previous hearing and uh, really I didn't follow up, I didn't receive an answer on that. But I wanted to see the feasibility. Um, how many, do you know how many fire hydrants there are across the city? 110,000. 110,000. So, that, that would mean, that would be like 110,000, probably maybe even double uh, parking spots that it takes away. Uh, because you can't park on either side. So from the 110,000, I don't see what the feasibility it is to maybe move some of those hydrants closer to like bus shelters, areas where you already can't park, um, and to do a study to see from the 110,000 of how many hydrants could actually be relocated to free up those parking spots, which will not cause a danger to any type of uh, uh, fire that's going on in the block, but to see if we could um, 
to move them in areas where it's already restricted, maybe near, near driveways and bus shelters? I, you know, I, I don't think um, our department would be against those moves if they didn't interfere with our ability to, uh, to perform, but that would be DOP, DEP's certainly Balawick of uh, um, we yes. inspect the hydrants, yes. but we don't fix them or uh, move them. So you know, I understand. So that would be between, um, that would be between DEP and DOT. Correct. But then they would need um, your approval that it, it won't interfere. So we we'll probably need those guidelines of in, and you know our guidelines are how close together they yes. they are yeah. or how far apart, et cetera, et cetera. As long as they fall within operational guidelines. So um, do you have a specific guideline on how many hydrants are s supposed to be in we a do. distance from each other? There is? Yes. Oh, so, so they'll be able to check that? And yeah, they know. Work. They okay. are Excellent. certainly aware of it. Great. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. I think that uh, we're done. Appreciate it. Thank you.
ready. Okay, so we're going to start our OEM panel right now. Uh, good afternoon. We're now moving into the final phase of the uh, Fire and Emergency Management Committee hearing. We'll hear from the New York City Emergency Management Department. Uh, we'll hear about their 2009 preliminary budget and the fiscal 2018 preliminary mayor's management report. The agency's 2019 preliminary budget totals $48 million and supports a headcount of 188 positions. The budget includes a very modest new needs package of merely $4.2 million for FY18 and no new needs for FY19. Uh, the agency's budget is also su is supported by city funds, but also relies heavily on federal grants that are accounted for on a year-by-year -year basis. The committee is interested in hearing the agency's contingency plan for potential federal funding cuts. Uh, today, I hope we hear more about how EM communicates, coordinates, plans, and prepares other city agencies for emergency situations with other city agencies, as well as other programs and initi initiatives the agency engages in. In order to inform and prepare the public, I want to thank Commissioner uh, Esposito and your staff. Uh, and before we begin, we will swear you in. Uh, please raise your right hand if you're going to testify. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Please uh, begin whenever you're ready, Commissioner. All right, thank you very much. Uh, before we get into the budget, I'll give you a little bit of overview of what we're about and what we've done uh, uh, last year, and then we'll go into any questions. But So good afternoon, uh, Councilperson uh, Borelli, members of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. I'm Joe Esposito. I'm the Commissioner of uh, the Department of New York City Emergency Management, and I'm happy to be here today to talk about our fiscal year 2019 budget. Uh, first, just a, a few uh, words about emergency management. We had a very busy year in 2017. We activated the Emergency Operations Center 14 times for a total of 107 days. That includes five winter weather events, two building vacates due to fires, uh, two flash floods, an active shooter at the Bronx Lebanon Hospital, a uh, heat emergency, the Port Authority explosion by the terrorists, and Hurricanes uh, Jose and Maria. During the extreme weather events, we also hold uh, citywide calls with elected officials and continually uh, sent out notifications for uh, localized incidents uh, in specific districts. And hopefully some of the folks here have been on those calls and, and we gave you the right information. Uh, we were activated for 73 days for Hurricane Maria. And during that time, we helped coordinate the operations of a hurricane reception center at the Julia D. Burgos Latino Cultural Center that assisted more than 2,000 households that were in need who had been evacuated from the uh, uh, hurricane areas. Uh, we deployed 300 city staff to Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands to assist in recovery operations. In addition, the New York City Urban Search and Rescue Teams, which we manage out of emergency management, deployed 190 members to Texas and Puerto Rico over the course of the hurricanes to assist in water rescues, evacuations, and wellness checks. The teams brought in food, water, medical supplies, as well as repair generators for two hospitals that were in isolated areas in Puerto Rico, very important for the well-being of the people in, in Puerto Rico. In 2017, we monitored over 3,000 incidents and sent our uh, citywide incident coordinators to 759 of those incidents. Uh, Notify NYC sent out more than 1,500 messages. In September, we launched the Notify NYC mobile app, uh, which, uh, which had over 48,000 uh, downloads in just three months. Uh, this, in addition uh, with our growth with traditional uh, uh, subscribership, put our numbers at over 700,000 registrants. It's a big number. Our goal is to have everyone that lives and works uh, in the city to, to uh, sign up for that. So we're still working towards that. Uh, we, held, uh, we held or participated in 91 interagency exercises uh, to make sure plans are understood and necessary protocols uh, for plans are ready to be implemented as needed. Our community outreach and engagement activities continue to grow, a very important part of emergency management, and you have likely seen us in your neighborhood at meetings, uh, town halls, fairs, uh, mobile office hours, and other community events. In total, we participated in 932 Ready New York events 
with more than 110,000 people attending, and we distributed more than 1 million emergency planning packets. We graduated 12 new uh, classes of CERT. CERT is our civilian, in, uh, employ and civilian emergency response teams. So we had 12 new classes, uh, taking our total to over 1,300 volunteers throughout the city. Uh, we hosted a disaster volunteer conference in June and a disabilities access and functional needs symposium in December. We also engaged 40 community partners in creating their own plans using our community emergency plan to uh, toolkit and also hosted an Immigrant Heritage Week breakfast with over 80 immigrants, uh, community leaders in attendance. And we think those plans uh, for uh, local people to do their own planning is very important. They're the, they're the folks who know the best about their neighborhoods. We want to engage them as much as we can to make their own plans. We think they're the best at solving their problems. We continue to look ahead to find our new ways to prepare the city and our citizens for the next emergency. With that, let me now provide a snapshot of our budget for the next year. Our projected total fiscal year 2019 city tax levy expense budget is 26.3 million. We rely on our city tax, levy, uh, city tax levy expense budget to support the majority of the agency's administrative, technical, and operational costs. The projected fiscal year 2019 personnel services budget is $5.7 million, which supports the 61 personnel lines paid directly through our tax levy funds. This includes $1.4 million in funding for 18 staff members dedicated exclusively for working on increased communication and services to people with access and functional needs. Uh, we think this is, again, uh, we were lacking in some areas in, in that area, and we think that this is a, goes a long way to providing the care that they need. Our other staffing uh, is supported through grant funding, which I'll talk about in a bit, and personnel on assignments from multiple city agencies. We have people from FD, PD, DEP, building department, they all uh, chip in sanitation, they come in and they work, they detail to us from other city agencies, a big, uh, big help to us. Our projected fiscal year for 2019, other than personnel services budget, is 20.6 million, which covers all the agency's operating and administrative costs. These funds are designated to cover our warehouse lease, our utilities, our telecommunications costs, including the maintenance and operations of our emergency operations center and backup facilities. This money also supports our fleet and all the additional equipment, supplies, and materials needed to run the agency. The agency receives grant funding, very important, to support many of our core programs. In the past year, we secured $25 million in federal funding primarily through the Urban Area Security Initiative Grant. This funding is vital to our ability to run many of our finest initiatives, including our Ready New York Public Education Program, our Community Emergency Response Team Program, our Continuity of Operations Program, the Geographic Information System, our Training and Exercises, our Watch Command Operations and Response, and the Citywide Incident Management System Planning. Additionally, uh, the grant provides funding for the city's emergency stockpile. We can, uh, we should have supplies in our warehouse that can supply 70,000 people for seven days, and this is all federally funded, very important. Uh, we work with City Hall and uh, OMB and the city's uh, congressional delegation and our partner agencies to push for full homeland security uh, funding in future years. This money supports critical operations within ours and several other agencies' uh, budgets and is critical to the city. So thank you very much. That's a bit of an overview for the agency and, my, and, and our budget. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, the question I really want to ask is, is what's on the menu in all the stockpiles of food, but uh, we'll save that for another day. You'd be surprised. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> uh, I, the first question I, I want to start with is, is sort of broad. Is there anything that OEM uh, requested from OMB but did not get in the preliminary budget? Well, there's always some items, but, uh, you know, as far as emergency management is concerned, our, our budget has just about doubled since I'm there. Uh, we went from uh, less than 200 people. We're at 260-something people now. So uh, we, we get everything that we need for the most part. Uh, if there is some dispute over something, we'll meet with OMB and usually work it out. So we're very happy with the way we interact with OMB. So your, your agency released its first uh, strategic plan d directing your, your goals through 2021. Um, w what specifically in the budget is geared towards meeting 
those new goals? Well, I, I, I think we're operating within our budget on the strategic plan. The, the reason for the plan was we wanted to take a whole look at the whole agency, what we were doing, how we were doing it, and how we could do it better, how we can service the community better. What we felt uh, as an agency was that the people need us the most don't really know what emergency management is about. So uh, we wanted to take a whole top-down look, bottom-up look at the agency and see how we can better service the people. And, that, and that's what it's about. So the strategic plans, we, we're really working within our budget for that. Um, in regards to Hurricane uh, Maria, c can you give us an update on, on whether we have any units and personnel deployed to this day, or, or is that, has that been scaled back? No, as of right now, we're at it. But we, we, we closed the, the center about a month or so ago. Uh, we were sending teams on a regular basis, two-week intervals down, down, to, down to Puerto Rico. Uh, that's, that's all finished right now, though. And it, outside of the uh, federal funding for some of the urban search and rescue teams, was there the ability to recover any additional money from the federal government for the expense? Sure, whatever we expended, we'll put in uh, uh, a request and, and get most of it back. Some of the, some of the assets that we sent down, they were on our dime, uh, particularly the things we sent to uh, San Juan. Uh, but a lot of the other stuff was under the EMAC uh, request, and we get reimbursed for that. So that's, that's in the process. We'd be in the process of doing that now. And then staying on federal funding, is, is there uh, any specific FY19 grants that, that previously had come from the federal government and you feel that may be at risk of losing? Well, we're always concerned. We, you know, we, we've, we've been getting 20-odd uh, something million every year. It's been going up just about every year. It's sort of leveled off now. But, you know, with the cu current climate in Washington, we, you know, we're concerned that, w uh, that there could be a cut. We don't think there will be, but it's, it's, everybody, it's in the back of everybody's mind. Do you regularly uh, make contingency plans each fiscal year for uh, the, the possibility of a, of a particular line item being not funded? Sure. We look at we 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 sit down on a weekly basis with our fiscal folks, and we go through what the needs are, what we're getting, and what would happen if we didn't get it. And so far, we've been able to adjust. If we don't get something in the same area, we're able to divert something else if it's a necessary uh, object or item, and we usually get it. Now, don't tell this to the like congressional hearing times, but so if they cut funding, we'd be able to just shift some resources, still provide almost the same level of, of, of preparedness. No, no. If they were to cut the grant funding, we would be in serious trouble. Uh, that's half of my budget. Uh, we would, you know, if they were to cut it fully, half my staff would go. Uh, and again, I talked about the warehouse. That is completely federally funded. At 70 supplies, everything from uh, things to take care of your pets. Again, after Sandy, we looked, uh, we did a lot of uh, searching of the agency and citywide searching on what we could do better. And one of it was uh, more items in the warehouse so that people would feel comfortable leaving their house and going to a shelter. Everything from, uh, look, a lot of those folks didn't leave their homes because they worried about their pets. We now have pet supplies in the warehouse, things of that nature. So that's all federally funded. If we were to lose that, we would lose the ability to uh, provide that service to the public. We think that's a major, major part of what we do at emergency management. That, in an, an, like I said, 50% of my budget is from federal funding. I would have to lock the door. And then uh, staying with shelters, um, how do you determine where to site emergency shelters and um, are any of the ones that we're prepared to use in need of renovations or repairs to to, to essentially maintain operations? Well, we have, we have approximately 450 shelters, and that's a moving number. You know, one will come off, one will come on. It depends. But the way we pick them, they've got to be outside the, the, the zones, the evacuation zones. We try and get them as close to the zones as possible. And we've had this discussion with many people where they'll tell us, hey, that, why is that center so far away? Well, it's got to be out of the flood zone. You can't evacuate people to an area that's going to flood. It just doesn't make sense. So we're trying to educate the public on that. There are 450. Uh, we have a number that are uh, retrofitted to deal with people with disabilities. Uh, we'd like to get them all uh, retrofitted, but right now we have about, uh, about 30 or so. By, by the season when it starts, June 1st, we should have 44 that are accessible. Uh, and by the end of the year, we're hoping to have 60 or so. 
So we're still in the 10 to 15 percent range, though. Yeah. For shelters. Yeah. Uh, is, is there a long-term cost estimate on, on how much those ADA retrofits would cost? Oh, they, it costs a lot of money. Uh, we're dealing with uh, the Department of Education. School construction is, is dealt into that, and uh, we we get the funding for that. It's a very important part of our funding, and uh, City Hall has been very good to us with uh, with funding that. Um, just going to the uh, Emergency Operations Center. We, we noted how many times it was uh, activated in FY18 so far. Um, but what is the dedicated budget and headcount just for the EOC? Well, that comes out of our regular budget. We have teams, um, a red, white, and blue team. Uh, our whole staff is split into these three teams. They're on, on call for three-week periods. So if, they, if we're activated, like we were just activated with the snowstorm, uh, they, they put aside their normal duties and they work out of the Emergency Operations Center. So it's not an additional budget item. What might be an additional budget item is overtime. They usually do 12 hours, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, seven days a week. So it'll cost us some overtime, but you, that's part of our budget. And, but, but the bulk of the EOC uh, workers would be still being paid by the other city agency budgets? Yes, sure. We, we pay our people, but we get, as you know, we get representatives from all the other city agencies' private sector. That is incumbent upon that agency to pay their personnel. And the, the last question is that the, the number of incidents uh, monitored by Watch Command has uh, declined slightly. Is, is there a reason why it's declined? Um, is there a change that, that we should be fighting for? Or? No, we have a protocol. It has to hit a certain level. In other words, with a fire, it's got to be a second alarm. Uh, so if you have 101 alarms, we probably are not going to go to them. Once they reach second alarms, we'll go to it. Uh, it's just the, the nature of the job will determine how many we go to. So less fires, less major incidents, everybody wins, we save some money. Yep. Um, questions, I think uh, I'll go to Council Member Cabrera first. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Commissioner, thank you so much. I'm a fan of, of your work and of your staff. Um, you provide service in that when people need it the most, they're very, very desperate. Um, I'm curious to know, I have a few questions. I'm curious to know if you could give us an update on the Hurricane Sandy Houses of Worship and Charitable Organizations Recovery Task Force that was released, uh, they released this report in April 2017. Uh, and that task force, you know, was charged with conducting an analysis of the damages and losses sustained by community-based organizations and houses of worship, as well as identifying recovery resources and making recommendations. Uh, to improve coordination between local, nonprofit, and faith-based sectors in advance of future emergency. And the reason why this is particularly a uh, dear question to me is because I, I was very much involved during Sandy I, um, of the, uh, the Kingsbridge Armory. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg allowed us uh, to use uh, the Kingsbridge Armory. We were able to funnel through outside uh, help about $7 million worth of resources that came from out of state, especially through religious organizations. Uh, and one of the biggest problems that those organizations encounter was that they needed a landing place. They wanted to help, they, they're ready to help, they're prepared, they have large warehouses, I've seen some of them uh, nationwide, uh, located strategically, uh, but it's either having the connection or a landing place. What do we learn through this task force that will help us uh, next time? Well, better communication. That, that, that's what it's all about. I mean, there are so many people in the city that want to help in an emergency, and the clergy, Houses of Worship, is always right in the forefront. We have so many volunteer organizations, but the, the clergy is always right in the forefront. So we're meeting with them. We're trying to meet as much as possible. There's been some legislation passed, I think, to deal with that uh, so we can better uh, encounter them and they can and get some funding, actually. Uh, you know, we had some issues in Staten Island where uh, one of the, one of the uh, houses of worship home, their location, they, they're having trouble getting the funding that, uh, getting reimbursed for what they did. So wow. I think as a result of Sandy, we've had some legislation, we've had some outreach, we'd love to deal with, we talked to you earlier about meeting with your clergy up there in the Bronx. We, we don't do enough of that, 
quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what we developed out of the strategic plan, to get out there more with the people that, the volunteer groups, the clergies, the people that want to help. And, and that's sort of our goal uh, going forward. And thank you, Commissioner, for, we, they had that discussion earlier and you were so open and I'm so eager to, for us to network, because uh, our network is our net worth when it comes to uh, disasters. Uh, I'm a firm believer that the more people know about what emergency management can do and what they can't do, in large part, the, the better we can service the people of this city. And I want to publicly thank you for your leadership in Puerto Rico. Uh, I saw firsthand, I stayed there for two weeks helping out in, in Hajuja and to other area, but we heard of your work over there while we were over there. Uh, and the need was so great, uh, and still uh, present, a present need over there. But I, I think it would have been much, much worse uh, if, um, if, if the work that you led uh, had not been there. So I want to publicly thank you for that. Uh, the other question I was going to uh, ask you was regarding the CERT program. Um, I, I love the CERT program. I'm happy to hear you have about 1,300? 1,300. We were at 2,000 at one point, but uh, we, we went through that. There were some folks that weren't as active as we like, so it's like 1,300 now of dedicated people. And that's what I was going to ask you about the activation. When was the last time w that you were able to activate and where there was an incident that took place? <coughs> and and what, yeah, they how does activated. that work? Did, did you make, they, they get phone calls? Uh, yes. How does they have the leadership structure? Yep. There's, oh, yeah, we have teams uh, throughout the city. All, every area has a different team. They have a way to communicate. We communicate with them, emails, things of that nature. They have radios. And we'll call them up on a daily basis. Uh, if you get a missing child, a missing elderly, we'll, we'll notify that local CERT team. They'll go out and help search. They'll go out to uh, community events, help us with our Ready New York events. They, they'll go from uh, helping us at a, at a street fair to helping us after a hurricane like Sandy. Wow. So they've been trained in enough to handle small incidents and big incidents. They're a tremendous asset we have. Uh, they do it for nothing at all. We give them uh, a lot of training. We give them some very good training. We give them uh, some, some, some golf shirts and golf hats, and they are happy to go out there and help. They're some of the most dedicated people I've met. Okay, my last question is in regards to preparation. I know when uh, Hurricane Sandy took place, that Mayor Bloomberg did not call upon FEMA to come and help. That's my recollection, uh, and to come in early. Uh, and I remember that we were lacking, lacking water uh, in certain instances. And my experience in Puerto Rico and mm, Katrina and, and working in Haiti, one of the things I noticed that is key is preparation, to have those supplies that you were mentioning earlier. How prepared are we if we were to have another Sandy that we could readily mobilize resources that we already have there and we're trying to acquire? And I know we're at the main line, so it makes it a little easier than if you were in an island, but nevertheless, it was still a challenge back then when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of bottles of water or whatever else is needed. How, how prepared are we in case of a... Uh well, I think we're a lot better prepared than we were for Sandy. First, uh, just about our connection with FEMA. We have a tremendous relationship with FEMA and the state. The FEMA Region 2 director now is, is Tommy Van Essen, who was the fire commissioner at one point here in New York City. I have a personal relationship with him, a very good working relationship with him. We meet on a regular basis. So uh, he's always calling up, what do you need? Even with the, the two Nor'easters, what do you need? What can we do? That's How's it great. going? So that's, that's terrific. But again, as far as the supplies, again, that warehouse, we have three warehouses, Long Island, Brooklyn, and, and Jersey. We had them separated on purpose. In that's case correct. something hits, we want to make sure we can get supplies in. But 70,000 people, we can supply uh, seven days of food and water, all different supplies for seven days. We have a contract in place where once we activate the warehouse supplies coming in, we have a contract with, with folks who would start resupplying. So we're confident that we're going to get the stuff out as fast as possible and we can re restock it as fast as possible. And do we have funding set aside for That's that grant funding. the contracting? And how much is that? Do you happen to know? I don't have that. How, what's our capacity to be able to handle? Branch? 
Uh, sure. So we do have, uh, as the commissioner said, this is federally funded, our entire emergency supply stockpile. Uh, anything in an emergency situation that would be a conversation with OMB and FEMA on how that would be funded. Okay, so you, so it's not like we have a certain amount of funding set aside under your agency, right? So it, you not to have, resupply. Uh, okay. We have the funds to conduct the operation now. Okay. But then immediately after uh, uh, an emergency is declared, either f federal, state, or city, we could turn in the process to request funding uh, from FEMA. Okay, fantastic. Again, Commissioner, I, I'm a fan of, of the work that you do. Thank you so much, and looking forward to getting together in the near future uh, so we could become bigger, better, and Great. broader. Thank and thank you. you for your kind words for the agency, and it's, it's the folks, my 260 folks that work at Emergency Management, they are the most dedicated people that I've worked with. They're terrific. Uh, incident happens, they, they're all volunteering to go out that door, come in and work. I have a tremendous, uh, a tremendous staff, and uh, we couldn't do it without them. So thank you for your kind words. Most impressive. Thank you. And I am a fan of your aforementioned uh, golf shirts and hats. Okay. So. <laughs> okay, great, great. <laughs> uh, Council Member Deutsch. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I just want to let you know that if you feel that the federal funding is in jeopardy, I know someone that is very close with our president, so uh, we can always make sure that's our chair. <laughs> <But> anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, all I want to say is that I, I want to commend you for your work that you do, and there's nothing that you can do to me to make me mad at you, because I remember those days when uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, when 24-story building had no heat during the winter months, and all it was is one phone call to your office or to you personally, and we had MTA buses outside. Uh, or that time on Avenue S in Sheepshead Bay when we had a whole building uh, during the, the heat and uh, there was no electric and everything was done in front of the building with generators and everything was done like within, I would say, a few hours. And sometimes you even beat me to the scene, which was very impressing, uh, impressive. And your agency really, you know, and when the city and state cannot play together nicely, it's amazing under your leadership how OEM coordinates city agencies, state agencies, and get things done, get things done gets the job done. So the caring, the sensitivity that you have and that the office has is really impressive, and this is something that we should all be proud of as New Yorkers. I just want to say thank you for that. And the only uh, request I really that I have is, uh, once again, just to ask if we could still um, take a look and having uh, clo in southern Brooklyn closer uh, evacuation centers um, in my areas of Manhattan Beach and Brighton Beach, because I, I mentioned a few times that the nearest place we have to go is not too, not too close, and I have one of the highest senior populations uh, in the city, and it's very difficult for people to travel too far. And, if something does happen, God forbid, um, then we need to get someone to that place sooner than later, and it's very difficult with all the new developments and construction and traffic and congestion to evacuate people. So if we have something closer than further, will really help. So I just want to ask you if you could look into that again, and thank you for everything you do, Commissioner. Right. And well, thank you for your kind words. And again, we have a great relationship with Roger Perino from the state and Tommy Van Essen from the federal government. I think our closest center for you is FDR High School. Yes. I think, again, it's got to be out of the zone, but if you have some other recommendations, uh, sites you want to look up, we'll look at them. We have that uh, uh, center in, in Brighton Beach that is in the flood zone, but I think we had talked about once the storm were to leave, we would use that location as a possible center once as a service center once, once the water had, had gone away. But again, the, uh, the centers have got to be outside the flood zones. But we'll, we'll take a fresh look at it. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. I think that's it. Thank you Great. very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start with our uh, next panel, uh, Vincent Variali, EMS Fire Officers, and Michael Greco, EMS, EMT, Paramedic, and Fire Inspectors.
Okay, so we can start. Okay. So uh, I don't know who wants to go first, but okay, take it. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. I just want to, I'm sorry, I'm Vincent Variali, president of the EMS officers, you know. <laughs> uh, I just want to go over a couple of issues that were mentioned here today. Um, First was the one, the last thing that was uh, talked about was this map, uh, mobile mapping unit for um, GPS, for navigation, for the uh, ambulances and uh, supervisor cars. You know, we, we first brought that up, I think it was 2011, and they managed to have a GPS system so they can watch everybody in the field. But at a time where you basically can buy a Hyundai and it comes standard with a navigation system, ambulances and command cars do, still do not have them. I don't know why it's taking eight years to get that done, but uh, I just want to point that out. We still today do not, none of the vehicles have any navigation systems to get to an emergency, which I believe would dramatically reduce response times if that was in place. Uh, with the turnover, high turnover rate we have in EMS, many members are put into areas they're not familiar with. Um, having a navigation system to tell them the fastest way to get to an emergency would, would significantly uh, help um, address the response times. Um, that was the first thing I wanted to bring up. The second thing, I wasn't present here for the last hearing. Uh, it was about diversity, but it was mentioned also in this report briefly. A uh, couple of things I have with that. First, the attrition rate, I noticed, was said to be at 7% in the report. Uh, that's incorrect. They don't count the EMS attrition rate when EMS people go from EMS to fire. They consider that a promotion, so they don't add those numbers in there. The actual attrition rate for EMS is 15%. Um, they also, and I think part of the reason why we have a big problem is the overall treatment. Compensation is definitely a big problem in EMS. We earn $40,000 uh, less a year than fire or other uh, uniformed emergency services. But it's also the overall treatment. I'll give you an example. In the report, it labels EMS as a civilian workforce, not a uniform workforce. Um, that offends many of our members. Uh, it's a, it, not only do we understand that uniform services are treated a little better than the, the city for, by the city, but we understand that uniform workforces also have to step up more because they're dependent on more to save lives and respond to emergencies, which we do in EMS, but yet we're not given the respect or treatment that those uniform services receive. This comes down to the, what I was originally coming back to is the diversity part. The reason why I believe, or from what I've seen, the fire department has a problem keeping people of uh, a black, Hispanic, uh, women to stay long enough to, when, they pass, when they go take this exam and, and try out the fire department is because the message that's being sent back to them. EMS is the most diverse, largest and most diverse portion of the fire department. We have the most uh, black male, female, Hispanics, all of them. And when they come to EMS and be part of the fire department, the poor treatment that they receive sends a message to them. It sends a message to all the members in the EMS workforce when they go back home to their friends and family, the message is don't work for this company, this place. They don't treat you right. They don't pay you correctly. They pay you uh, less than everybody else. The benefits are less than everybody else. And the treatment, overall treatment, is not up to par with other uniformed agencies. So if you have a desire to become a, a person who works for emergency services, don't go to the fire department, go somewhere else. And that's why I think you see that there's an initial interest, but then that drops off. Because when they hear the message that comes back to them from friends and family who are currently in this FDNY emergency service, emergency medical services, they're like, oh, well, maybe it's not a good idea to stay here. Maybe we should leave. Um, another issue, uh, I saw in the report it said additional s supervisors were added to uh, increase, the lines were increased to help uh, uh, with the supervisory. Well, PSAC 2 in EMD currently has no captains available. So I don't know where they're increasing the supervisory uh, members, but I don't see it in a lot of areas. Um, fourth, I noticed the EMS workload is 95% of the workload being done by EMS. EMTs and paramedics, yet only 16% of the budget goes to EMS. This is a big problem. 
Uh, first, EMS facilities, they're saying they're hiring more EMTs to replace private ambulance companies that are leaving the system, which is another problem. But they keep adding more EMS, EMTs and paramedics, but they're not adding the amount of EMS facilities, which is a huge problem. We, have, we actually have members who have to use locker rooms in garages where male and females are getting changed in front of each other every single day in the garage, because we can't fit any more people in these stations. It's horrendous. Um, and yet, in the budget, I didn't see any money allocated for EMS facilities. Uh, the other issue that was brought up was the, P, the fly car or PRU program. They, they said it was baseline money budgeted for it. This program has been in effect for over a year and a half. We still have no rules, no program outline of what we're supposed to be doing as supervisors and officers. Um, we have currently a uh, decision pending from the uh, OCB in regards to the overwhelming workload put on to the paramedics and EMS lieutenants. Uh, they're basically doing triple duty. They're working as a lieutenant, they're working as a paramedic, doing performing patient care, and they're working as a training officer. And there's no rules to, to guide them on how this is supposed to work a year and a half later and there's no additional compensation offered to them for the additional workload. Again, you have people earning $40,000 less than everyone else, doing more with less, but not being rewarded in any way. And they wonder why the message, or nobody wants to stay here. Um, another thing I want to bring up is the, uh, this idea that fire does medical calls. Yes, they do respond to medical calls but it's not equivalent as EMS responding to medical calls. When members leave the EMS workforce, they are EMTs and paramedics. When they go to fire, they are certified first responders, which is a level below that. So even if you're a paramedic, if you go work for fire and you respond to that medical emergency, you are not performing those duties as a paramedic. You're performing duties of a certified first responder. So it is not this idea that it's equal or they're still doing medical calls is not a fair comparison and it shouldn't be looked at as such. Um, my final topic or issue is the span of control. They're adding additional units, they're adding personnel, they're not providing the support that's needed that goes with that. Besides the facilities that I brought up, supervisors. Fire, according to the federal government, state and city, guidelines and standards for span of control, there should be one officer or one supervisor for every seven individuals. One in 10 is allowed for uh, law enforcement. In New York City, fire has a span of control of one in four, one in five. Police has a span of control of one in seven, one in eight. EMS, the span of control is one in 20, one in 40, and one in 60. The areas you spoke about, um, uh, Brooklyn South and Staten Island, for example, it's one in 60, one in 40. Um, I'll give one quick example of where span of control, if it was properly uh, um, done, would have made a difference. I'll bring up the Eric Gardner case. That day, when Eric Gardner was on the floor dying, the two EMTs that responded from a private uh, hospital were there with 50 cops around them, and listen, I've been in situations like that before. It, it could be intimidating for an EMT with 50 cops around them and sergeants and lieutenants telling them, come on, just quick, get the body out of here, do what you gotta do, just get off the scene, because they don't want a riot to break out when, when something's going on like that. Problem is, if you notice in that video, medical care wasn't being administered right away. Had an EMS lieutenant been on that scene, that is our job, to make sure we are the liaison with the police officers, with the police sergeants and lieutenants, we are there to command and provide direction and manage, coordinate operations on the scene. Had a lieutenant been there, that would have been done. The nearest lieutenant was in Rossville, Staten Island. It took him 23 minutes to get there. By the time he got there, the whole thing was over. So <laughs> Staten Island is grossly understaffed when it comes to officers. There's only two on the whole island. And Brooklyn South has two from Sunset Park all the way to Coney Island. They got 30, ambulance, 30 to 40 ambulances. That means they're responsible for 60 to 80 people spread out through six different, seven different communities. It's absolutely ridiculous and insane, the lack of span of control that exists in EMS. And we barely need more supervisors 
to cover more communities. Thank you very much. I'm available for any questions you may have. We'll finish the panel and do questions. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Michael Greco, Vice President, Local 2507. Uh, I appreciate you guys giving and gals giving us the time to uh, point out a couple of things. The first things I wanted to start with, um, I wanted to highlight our fire inspectors uh, and their role in fire safety. I do feel that our fire inspectors are very undervalued and underappreciated. Um, the buildings that they do inspect, um, the record of fire deaths that have been brought down due to the fact that they do their inspections is something that really should be noted. Um, I was looking at a bunch of inconsistencies in the budget. He brought it up to 16% for EMS, 2% for fire inspectors. Looking at the numbers, the costs to run the fire inspectors are 48 million, but yet they bring in 96 million. Um, their pay is tremendously low compared to other counterparts uh, in buildings. So to watch, as I read through this entire budget, the inequities of how the EMS service is treated from the other services, $600 million budget, we have a $200 million income, so that puts us at a $400 net cost, I mean $400 million net cost, $1.3 billion to run the rest. They get 68% of the overall budget and we get 16%. It's a problem. Um, it affects the retention rate. It's a direct reflection of our pay compared to uniform service. Um, if our pay was better, our retention rate would be higher. And I don't like to use money income as a reason for why somebody should get paid. I understand that argument, but when you're doing a vital service, the money that comes in should offset and then should be used to reinvest into the service that's provided. So in, in short, the EMS calls, they dominate FDNY responses. We do almost four times the calls, but we receive a quarter of the budget. The money spent on fire is not misplaced. Don't get me wrong. Everything they do and everything they are about is necessary. I'm not taking away from what a fireman does, what a police officer does, what sanitation does. They are all vital services. Um, if your house is on fire property, a firefighter is there to protect that. Those are memories. A police officer keeps you safe. Sanitation stops the plague. Um, they're all beneficial. It is time that EMS is recognized. Over 100 years, we've seen how these emergency services have progressed. However, it's time to reanalyze the role EMS and fire protection plays in our city today. The funding must be increased dramatically. And I'm not talking a $10 million increase here. We need a reevaluation of hundreds of millions of dollars. Pay, equipment, stations, personnel, they need to be doubled if we really want to provide and protect. Um, the same effort that has been put into fire safety, education, it needs to be adapted in 911 education. The amount of 911 calls that come in, if the councilmen and women understood what we do respond to in that 1.2 million calls, that's just FDNY. Obviously, our privates respond to the other percentage. But we are getting cardiac calls for stubbed toes. We are getting un people who are intoxicated coming in as unconscious. Those are the one, two, three segments that we see. Um, if we educated the public a little better on when to call 911, the same way the Close the Door initiative, the AED initiative, the money that can be put into that would save in response times. We have a seven and a half minute response time fires response time to their structural fires of four minutes. We need that sort of response time. If you're having a heart attack, that's the response time you want. Not six seconds, less, five seconds. You want minutes shaved off. And a $10 million put into a section of Queens or a section of here is not going to do it. We need a reevaluation and a, re a study, something done to reevaluate how to make EMS a vital service in the city that it is and how to recognize them pay them and treat them and staff them appropriately. Yesterday's storm, our members got forced into overtime. We had to stay. We were short-staffed, but we did it. Our members are forced on corners in the middle of a blizzard on an ambulance. We're not even allowed to shelter in place at a station because the stations are too far apart. The high winds, trees are falling down. Where are our members? In parks, on street corners. We need facilities where we can move 
and leave from the facility. A firehouse there strategically located, again, over 100 years that was placed. He talked about fire hydrant responses, and there they have a detailed plan of how far a fire hydrant has to be from one another to create a proper response. Our answer is go sit on a corner. I don't care what the weather is. We don't get breaks. We don't get meals. Um, if you're forced to work another eight hours, if I do an eight hour, and yes, contractually, we, we'd never got a break. If you force me to work another eight, that's 16 hours without a meal. We are not treated the way we should be treated as the vital service that we are, and it's the budget that would be a start. And paying our members, increasing the budget by twofold, would be a start, not the $10 million. I do appreciate this time. Sorry if I ranted a little bit. No, thank you. I don't have anything to say. Thank you. You're just uh, there for the ambiance. Yeah. He's our consigliere. I'm the consigliere. Just, uh, so the 15% the attrition, that was per year that you pointed out? Yes, it's 15%. They don't count the members who leave from EMS to go to fire. Right. So, so you, you're saying that's because of the, the – they're saying that essentially 14 uh, – 7% uh, of the members are getting promoted. Seven percent. Well, see now that that's a tricky term they use a lot, and and when we talk in OLR, uh, there's attrition rate and there's turnover rate. Bottom line is, the EMS loses fifteen percent of their workforce per year. every year. Right. right now, where they go, that those are numbers we, I have to look more into detail to. But I do know in one of the hearings and even in this report. They keep bringing the attrition rate or the turnover rate or whatever they want to call it down lower to 7%. That's what I've heard 5%. Out, yeah. Right. That's what she just Right. I heard 5%. But that's because they're not counting those members who go from EMS to fire. They say it's a promotion. Just a question on the, uh, the ambulance GPS. So as you pointed out, people might get staffed in an area they're not familiar with. How do you find out where to go? Well, we're assigned to stations. Um, but... As my uh, colleagues here stated that we are so understaffed, um, sometimes members are put on different units or mandated and put on different units working a different area. Um, actually, it happens very often on, mm -hmm. on a regular basis. So if I generally work one area all the time, I may get used to that area and know that area, but now if I'm mandated to work another unit and I work that other area, I may not be as familiar with that area. So if you have GPS or navigation on board, um, there's a difference between navigation and GPS because they keep saying right. we have GPS. If you have navigation on board, it would, it would certainly help in guiding you. Just as of now, a, a random you know, street, yeah, I'll obscure answer. street comes over the, the, the radio. How do you find out? I'll answer that question. Um, procedurally, we are given Hagstrom paper maps. We are to look into our maps and figure out where we're going because technically we aren't allowed to use electronic devices while working. We're not allowed to use our phones, technically. Realistically, I go to my phone, right. or if I'm in the tech seat, there's a driver's seat tech seat. If I'm in the tech seat, I go to my phone, I punch in the address, and I use my phone, and, and that's how we go. That's the bottom line. It, there's two issues with that. First, they, you're supposed to technically use the Hangstrom paper map. Mm -hmm. However, if your truck isn't moving within a minute, they immediately want to like, talk discipline now because right. you're taking too long to move. I don't know how long they want you to, I mean, you have to look at a map. What are you supposed to do? Second, Using your own phone for the, uh, uh, to get directions is a problem because if I do that and now let's say whatever program or software I'm using puts me in another area or a different place and I don't get there, now I'm at fault for not right. using the proper procedure or following the procedures and not using it. So it, it puts, again, the, it puts all the uh, problems on the employee's shoulders which cause more stress. I was wondering who, who buys all the Hagstroms at the rest stop. You know, <laughs> it's, <no>. us. Yeah, <laughs> it's us. It's us. <laughs> and the worst part about that discipline is the GPS, when you're sitting for a command discipline, if I go seven blocks, even three blocks the wrong direction, in Manhattan, lights and sirens, it could take four minutes if you go the mm -hmm. wrong way. But I thought it was that way. When you're sitting for discipline, they will print out the, their GPS that's on the truck that pings you, They'll print out that GPS and show you, oh, look, you moved three blocks, and they will discipline you for going the wrong way. And they'll even print out a MapQuest type and say, this was the proper route. So they're telling you which way you should have gone after the fact by discipline and not letting us. Right. Speaking of which, I'm glad you brought that up. I've actually had a discussion because 
the person was going to be disciplined for using, they were showing them the, the, the way to get to the job using Google Maps, but the person used Waze. So there was a difference in the timing. Yeah. I'm like, I can't even believe we're having this discussion. You know, you should have navigation on right. the ambulances. It comes standard in the cheapest car available today. I don't understand this. For eight years, they've been doing this mobile mapping unit. <laughs> what, are they mapping the world or are they, is it just New York City? I don't get it. <laughs> and, and just one more question that I have. Um, I, I reread your testimony on, on the fly cars, and I understand, but just br broader, big picture, are the fly cars good? Is, is it something that's working? That's a great question. From a public perspective. That's a great question. I don't know how they, uh, I don't know the answer to that question, because they started the fly car program the same time they added additional BLS units. So they're saying the response times went down. Is it the fly car program that brought the response times down, or is it the additional BLS units? Because an argument can be made that, hey, if you add, I know it's crazy, but if you add more ambulances, response times will go down. That's what it seems logical to me. So I don't know if the PRU program or the fly car program is working. I feel like one of the first rules of a pilot program is to have a control group, and it doesn't sound like they had that. Well, one thing they do know, and I, they would agree with, is that it exacerbated the supervisory, uh, or the lack, there's now a lack of supervision uh, in the Bronx. It's made that worse. Because as a, throughout the, other, the rest of the city, a lieutenant doesn't work with partnering up with a paramedic and provide medical care. A lieutenant's sole uh, um, job duties are to coordinate and um, manage uh, operations on the field. With the field fly car, what it's doing is I'm not only managing and coordinating operations, I'm providing direct patient care and I'm training the paramedic I work with to be my future lieutenant. So I'm doing three jobs. So, it, you know, when you give too much, when you overwhelm somebody with that kind of work, it, it, it's going to hinder their ability to, to perform all the functions to par like the rest of the city. And from our standpoint, uh, Local 2507, it blurs the lines of what is a supervisor and what is a partner. When two medics are out together and you're making decisions on somebody's life, you bounce the ideas off of each other. Right. And when you have a supervisor there now, does his opinion medically become more sufficient simply because he outranks you? Um, and there has been situations of one partner would order the other partner, and it, it, it creates for a tension when you're treating a patient that you shouldn't have to deal with. Supervision is necessary. As two paramedics, I want to work with my paramedic, and when my supervisor comes over, you supervise. Uh, liaison between PD, between whoever, and if I need to call medical control, if I need to call other police, that's what a supervisor's for. When does the supervisor break free as a partner to make those liaison moves? It blurs the lines between. <laughs> and that goes right back to what I said about the rules. We were a year and a half of this program, and the only direction we were given from the department is use your best judgment. Many people have been disciplined because they used it best judgment, what they thought was the right thing to do, and they were disciplined because it didn't uh, conform to what they wanted you to do. So you're not going to give me anything in writing. You're going to say, use your best judgment, but then you're going to find me at fault when I do. This is a problem. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Cabrera for a question. Yeah, that sounds to me like you can't measure. You know, they can move the, the line in terms of, you know, what you're supposed to do. So it, it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to make a comment that maybe my recommendation here, uh, my humble recommendation is that part of the budget, there will be a study regarding what we just brought to our attention. That way we could properly assess all of these issues and we have the data that uh, is needed in order uh, for us to really support uh, the EMS uh, in every uh, possible level because tell you being someone that went through a heart problem in 2015 uh, you know when you call you know I didn't I didn't have to call that time but I had to tell you that it's one of the scariest things you could ever go through in your life but if you have to call you want somebody to get there ASAP you know it's never just too soon so we, we want to make you as efficient, as effective as possible and, and break through all of these, you know, I, it just, I'm baffled. I'm sitting here baffled, to be honest with you. I'm sure you're even more baffled because you deal with this literally uh, every single day. 
uh, dealing with this. And, um, and I stand by my comment that I made to the commissioner earlier. You heard it. it. To me, it's an issue of value. You pay people what they're worth. And I can't think, I, I still don't understand why you, you don't have equity pay here. It's our biggest fight. Um, it'll be done through multiple avenues. Right now, we have 5,000 members who can't afford to live in the city that they serve. Um, I'm one of them. I just had to move out to Long Island because I just couldn't afford here. Um, we have people who love this job. They are dedicated to EMS. They're dedicated to being fire inspectors. They're dedicated. It's they don't feel at times they're not appreciated as much as they appreciate the work. Hmm. And that's all we're trying to bring light to. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your service, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And with that, we are done for the day. Thank you.